this is a very daunting topic, an update to our agriculture position. And I am so lucky to have been referred to Kent Olson. And should I call you professor or doctor? Kim. Kim. <laughs> okay. My sister asked me that once and I just said, sir. <laughs> and as well you should. <laughs> and Bill Lazarus, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about these two fellows. Kent is a professor in the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Minnesota and is involved in applied research, on-campus teaching, and extension education in farm management. He's published two books on farm management. His research has emphasized farm-level management issues such as production efficiency, the interaction between farming and the environment, decision-making, and the impact of government policies. So you can see how he is just the right guy for us. Um, he's worked in Sweden, Uganda, Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia, India, Poland, and Italy. Um, and the U.S. And the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> he teaches farm management, world food, I mean, I <laughs> world food problems and agribusiness management on campus and internationally. Professor Olson grew up on a farm in Iowa, but we won't hold that against him. And <laughs> Lee is from Iowa. And she's a perfectly wonderful woman. <laughs> he received his PhD in economics from Iowa State University. He joined the faculty of the University of Minnesota in 1985. Dr. Bill Lazarus is a professor and extension economist in the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Minnesota. He works in farm management, research, and extension with a general focus on crop and livestock production economics. One recent project involved analyzing the effectiveness and cost of different agricultural best management practices that could reduce nitrate levels in surface waters of Minnesota for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, economics of growing biomass crops for energy is another research, recent research area. Dr. Lazarus has a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Illinois, well vetted by Lynn Marcus, who has traveled in some of those same footsteps. Dr. Lazarus grew up on a dairy farm in Pennsylvania. So, that being said, I hope you all reread the current positions on agricultural topics from 1988 yeah. in the newsletter. Then, the update to which they are um, helping us address ourselves then is about the innovations and changes in technology and economics since our <coughs> position so that we know whether or not we need an update. So, take it a Take it away, guys. Okay. Thank you, Gene. Uh, it is a pleasure for us to be here. Uh, we read some of the materials, watched some of those videos that's on the list that Gene provided us. Um, but we aren't sh really sure what you're interested in or what you're looking or where you're coming from. Uh, so Bill and I thought that maybe each of us can give a little short um, 10 or 15 minute intro on some of the things we know and then just open it up for very long Q&A time because we don't know for sure what you're looking for versus us talking off this way and you're looking that way. But listening to uh, the topics you said you've already covered in other meetings and what's coming up and even what's in here, I was reminded of the, uh, the line about may you live in interesting times. <laughs> you heard that one? <laughs> Supposedly it's a what, how many people think it's a Chinese curse? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've heard, and I, you know, I'm an academic, I'm supposed to reference what you say, so I thought, I'll just look it up, find out where it is. Well, it turns out it's a fictional, I'm a fictional story about, about Chinese characters, but it's written by a British author. <laughs> 
Christos. It's not even uh, Chinese or written. It's written. But anyway, it's a lovely little quote. The curse. So, not that we're living in those times, though, are we? We do have a few. Uh, but let's start. Um, in ag, uh, sustainable technology, ag, finance, a lot has changed since 88. Um, but in some ways, those uh, lots of parts of what are there uh, are still attainable. There's just still some fine tuning on, on all those things. As I look back, one part of my job uh, has kind of evolved away from that. But I used to watch the finance of <coughs> farmers in Minnesota quite a bit, in charge of uh, analyzing the farmers' financial data that they kept and then sent in in these management associations and then we averaged the pool uh, and it was uh, there weren't that many farms but it turns out to be maybe 10 percent of there's something like 80,000 farms in Minnesota according to the USDA or Congress's definition but maybe only 20,000 of those are really commercial sized the rest of them are residential small hobby part-time still uh, good they're still produced but if you look majority of where it's produced, it's only 20,000 farms. Yeah. And this database has about 10% of the rate. <coughs> if you look at that, um, things that have changed, um, the last few years have been very good, especially for crop farmers. The median income in this group was 192,000 last year. The median is in the middle, not the average. So those that are really high are just they aren't affecting that. They're affecting the average, but not the median. 190. That's up from 127 in 2011. Then roughly 50 to 60 thousand in the early 2000s. We don't. We expect it to be down this in 13. That's where the prices have come down. Some other with some other costs. So it's it's still amazing where it is right now. Some of that's reflected in size, but also in uh, just prices and incomes of that farm. ROE, rate of return on equities. Am I covering your numbers? No, I didn't talk about that. Uh, but ROE, something like what we would get in a savings account, which is an astounding 0.8%. Oh, if you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, last year, 2012, this farms, these farms averaged 23%. Wow. Uh, it was 5 to 12 in early 2000s. They've, and I don't begrudge that at all, they've had some really bad years. So I'm very happy they're having good years. Hopefully they're stocking them away somewhere. <laughs> Total assets uh, went from, were from 2.8 million on average went in 2012, up from 1.6 million in the early 2000s, so almost a doubling. The size, is kind of, physical size is larger and that financial size. So to cover the finance is a very important topic because they are very large right now. Cost of production is essentially up 30%, 30% in three years. Now that also might be coming down as prices went up, input suppliers respond, fertilizer prices went up, gas went up, diesel went up, but those have come back a little bit. So maybe that'll back off, but it's still an astounding number for just three years. Add a fourth, and maybe it's only 20 or 25 percent. It's still amazing. Uh, that's also affected by choice of production methods, uh, choice of inputs. Uh, a lot more purchased off the farm, which push, pushes that cost up. We're sort of producing their own instead of using their, their own animal manure, using their own labor. They're hiring a lot done. They're buying the commercial or even buying the manure from the neighbor that has the larger livestock facility. So those costs, but it's really, a lot of it is the price. And the method, the seed, uh, GMO seed is a lot more expensive than regular seed, but they don't, also don't have to spend as much on the herbicide, that's the choice. And related to some of your questions uh, on organic, that, the choice of method, 
one study I did years ago now was looking at uh, organic versus conventional. And organic and other sustainables do reduce costs, but the yield does not, not always come along. And some of that's their, they don't have as much uh, off-farm purchase. So there's a, if you're purchasing a lot off-farm, your finances are a little more sensitive to what that price does. You don't have as big of a margin. But there's also that question of uh, can organic farming feed the world? And the Scientific American article that's in your list does a nice job saying that it looks like it could, but not in all situations. Not, uh, you know, maybe it's a hybrid that has to come along. <coughs> also listening to some of those uh, videos in your list, uh, it sounds wonderful. You talk to uh, Fred Fisherman and some others, uh, you know, they're doing wonderful jobs but to try and extrapolate that clear across everywhere is always a problem. The, the good managers will do well with that, whatever management system they choose or is given them, but not everyone's a good manager. And the good managers are the ones that increase in some of too. But that scientific article uh, back on choice of production methods, uh, that hybrid idea is in our future. Have to work with it and adapt. Where needed, we go that way for environmental production. Where needed, we go that way for cost of production. Uh, total world food <coughs> production. That idea showed up in the Scientific American too. And I talk about that quite a bit in my world food <coughs> class. You know, in one sense, we do produce enough calories and enough protein in the world to feed everyone sufficient, but not everyone can afford it. Not everyone can get it. Um, and Sen, Sen, Indian economist, talks about that people need the ability to command food. As in, they need to have enough money and income to say, I'm going to buy sufficient calories and sufficient protein. That command idea, I like that word that he uses, command. Just distribute it. You know, who's going to pay for shipping food all over the world? Logistics, how is it going to be distributed? So there are some questions to think about just in terms of how we produce. <clears throat> and the other, another quote that I like, uh, backing up a little ways, is the idea that everything's connected to everything. But each one of those issues on your list are related to each other, and there's so many things outside that list and outside of agriculture that are impacted. It's a bit like that uh, lack of mole game. Which I've only seen it in parts, but you try and hit one and another one pops up. Well, that's what's, you're going to run into that. You always do when you hit your policies. Anyway, moving on, running out of my self a lot of time. Uh, cost of production up, price volatility is way up for a lot, a lot of commodities. And that's another reason that, that directly affects us fin finances. Not just the cost of production, the revenue side, but the riskiness of it. Now, do farmers have the financial capability and production ability to protect themselves? Land prices went up, but uh, now we're starting to wonder whether they've leveled off. They're starting to. We'll see. Concern there is that are they going to drop off <coughs> as rapidly as they did in the 80s, early 80s? And the, the conclusion is uh, no, and it won't be as bad. But they still might drop off, but they won't be as bad because farmers aren't, didn't finance it as much with them. The bankers remember that and were scared and weren't pushing the debt on them. So a lot of the high-priced land is purchased with cash. So, you know, if, they, if they fall, there's a paper loss in equity, but not necessarily a financial catastrophe. Now there'll be some farms that have that trouble. Not as much as it was in the early 80s. 
anyway, all of that, increased cost, greater returns, volatility in prices, bigger farms, creates that interest in uh, finances and risk management. Uh, and there's that, uh, that brings me to the Farm Bill, which is under debate right now, has been for a long time. Uh, and we'll see uh, if the conference committee can come out of that. Well, large parts of that that affect farming are related to risk management, both in the commodity titles and in the crop insurance titles. One and uh, title one, and title ten, or eleven. It's only a thousand pages or more from the Senate. <laughs> but those, both of those, uh, in both the House and the Senate, the idea and how those work, uh, the rules are changing slightly, but the same ideas are there. Both of them have a price protection and also a revenue protection under commodities. Arguments between the committee that might derail it, should they put it on, a, say, a multi-year basis on yields and acreage, or should they do it on what they planted, say, in 2014? A lot of argument about what should be protected or not, and how that should be established. Arguments about World Trade Organization, whether uh, if you put it on this year, this year's acreage alone, that affects the farmers' decisions and how to do it, and that gets into Brazil's argument over the cotton program about the policies affecting the market. But if you put it as the Senate does on a historical base acreage historical yields, well, those payments don't necessarily affect today's planning decisions. So, well, but they're both different. They're both looking at it different ways. Uh, crop insurance, um, crop insurance has been around a long time. I remember my dad buying hail insurance. It's all in central Iowa. It's what you could buy is hail insurance. Uh, it actually started with uh, raisin producers in California. They would dry them naturally, put them on paper out in the fields. So they were very interested. A little bit of rain on those grapes as they were drying, and the grapes would mildew and be gone. Couldn't sell them at all. So they had crop insurance, and it was hailed and multi-purpose. Well, now, then the government got even more involved, giving subsidies to the agents, subsidies to the farmers, covering, blanketing things anymore. And now there's something called supplemental uh, supplemental coverage options, SCO. Well, shallow loss, I think that's it. There's so many acronyms. SCO is the acronym, and I think it's supplemental coverage option. Uh, but on top of crop insurance, and there's some estimates uh, in your list, uh, Environmental Working Group has a link to uh, friend of mine, Bob Bruce Babcock, not, not at Iowa State, did a study uh, published by Environmental Working Group that shows that there could be a loss in an area on some farms that don't have any physical or financial loss could get a, a higher <coughs> revenue because of those that supplemental coverage option. The way it's set up and the way the crop insurances are set up. So there is a concern for you to consider. Everything's related. Does a question I can I wonder myself about how much do taxpayers need to protect the farmers from risk? Should they be how much should they be paying? How much should they be subsidized? Or should we protect them in the sense they might get more than they would expect in a normal year without insurance? I don't. Oh, we've debated that, or if it's even out there, people are thinking about it, but it's been slipped into both programs, Senate and House. Let's see what happens. I'll hurry up, though. Just a couple last little things. Uh, well, all of that, why, why I worry about finance and crop insurance and supplemental coverage and commodity programs, what's that have to do with finance? If you take away risk, in any business, they have a lot more uh, higher probability and better confidence of being able to pay back loans. The banks have, have better confidence. And if you have better probability of paying back loans, banks like you, 
they're willing to give you more, that increases size, increases consolidation, one of the issues on your list. Uh, so that it comes back to that also, consolidation <coughs> finance as well as uh, subsidies and how to spend money. Uh, regulatory environment, a couple of last points. Um, yeah, there's, there's always a reason for a regulation. Often it's a good re reason. And the protection of something. You know, stop something that's going on. Uh, but one man's, uh, one person's good regulation is another person's uh, over-regulation. So how, how in the world get balance that going on? Um, the ability to preserve payments, get the crop commodities, the commodity programs, the crop insurance, but what does that do to uh, protecting the environment if you're getting bigger and planting more acres? Uh, and just a, one last comment uh, on food policy. SNAP, or uh, AKA uh, food stamps, a huge debate. And it's, a, it's 70, 80 percent of the fund the whole nutrition program is, and the larger that can be SNAP. And that's what's, uh, that's a big, not, not the only debate, there might be some other things that you rail it in the conference committee, but that's a huge debate about House wanting to cut a lot, Senate not as much. <coughs> what is the taxpayer's role in uh, supporting and subsidizing farmers versus using money to uh, support lower income people? Relieving their food insecurity. So that's, the, that's the question. So we need to come up with good answers. I'm going to quit. So I'm sorry, I took too much more time than I said. Yeah, um, yeah I'm Bill Lazarus, and thank you for inviting us. Um, just might mention one uh, one project that I've been working on uh, lately. Um, uh, working for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency on uh, uh, nitrates in surface water. And uh, the state, and I guess all states have uh, uh, standards for, surf for, for drinking water, um, 10 parts per million, but uh, <coughs> Minnesota's concerned about some of the surface waters, particularly in the southern part of the state, that, that have high uh, nitrates that, in them. And so uh, I understand that uh, within the next couple of years, they, they plan to adopt a, a standard related to surface water uh, nitrates um, and um, so um, they've been working with the University of Minnesota. Uh, David Mulla is a, a soil modeler who's been looking at where nitrogen nitrates uh, come from and the pathways that they get into uh, streams uh, and for, for several years uh, and then they uh, approached me a couple of years ago just to look at it from the economic standpoint, look at what the cost would be for some of the, the practices that could be implemented to to reduce it. And, and nitrogen is <coughs> a real common uh, element uh, in, in uh, the world, and uh, it, it's everywhere. And so uh, reducing it is going to be be uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, we've been looking at, at uh, just crop production practices, uh, about three quarters of the the nitrogen that uh, in, in surface water comes from uh, crop agriculture and then some others come from uh, um, point sources, uh, sewage treatment plants and livestock operations and, and uh, forests, that sort of thing. But we've been looking at, uh, at the crop practices uh, from the standpoint of this uh, the standard they uh, are thinking of uh, adopting. And also uh, Minnesota and all the other states in the Mississippi River uh, basin are uh, uh, looking at ways to reduce both nitrogen and phosphorus in the, uh, the river from the, the Gulf of Oxia standpoint uh, as well. Uh, some of the things that uh, I've been modeling are just reducing the rate of, of fertilizer application on corn, particularly uh, where uh, farmers are, uh, in surveys of, of um, average fertilizer rates that farmers are using there somewhat higher than the research would suggest uh, is a, a profit maximizing uh, rate. And there's reasons, it's not a new uh, issue, but there are reasons from the risk management, that sort of thing, to uh, temptation to use a little bit more than uh, than the extension recommendations say is, 
is the problem maximizing level. So just reducing rates. Uh, a lot of equipment in the southern part of the state supplied in the fall, so it can shift from either a spring pre-plant application or a side dress after the crop is growing, and then some other practices like restoring uh, wetlands or uh, uh, doing things with tile lines, uh, either uh, controls that would shut off the tile lines when during times of the year when the crops really don't need the drainage, or diverting the, the uh, flow uh, the outlet from a tile line through uh, kind of a chamber of wood chips or something that that denitrifies part of the nitrogen um, cover crops. So they're they're kind of tough to do in uh, Minnesota with our short growing season. Uh, perennial crops, uh, particularly if we had uh, markets for biomass crops and energy uh, processing facilities, something like that, that would uh, give a more of a, a market for perennial crops like switchgrass and that sort of thing, uh, that would be very helpful. So we just have a, a model looking at uh, all of those um, those uh, possible practices, and then they'll be and actually they have a, a nutrient production plan that they're rolling out now. It's a public meeting this afternoon in St. Paul and some other meetings around the state where we'll be talking about some of the the ideas for for addressing the issues. One problem with uh, Nitrogen is mainly from non-point sources. The Clean Federal Clean Water Act addresses point sources, and uh, crop practices really are not regulated under the Clean Water Act or uh, any of the, the normal uh, regulations. So, it's how they'll induce crop farmers to to uh, adopt things that cost money uh, and uh, uh, address the problem is going to be interesting to see in the next few years. But you know, that's been one interesting project I've been working on for, for several years. I'm just kind of curious, uh, how many of you uh, grew up on farms or have connections in one sort or another with, with agriculture? Because I know a lot of people in the mm -hmm. city do, so you probably have your own perspectives on a lot of this uh, that are probably uh, closer to the ground than ours. But, yeah, that's one, one project uh, that I've been involved in. I've kind of opened up to Sure. Uh, one reason we're sitting down is that uh, we wanted it to make sure it felt much more like a dialogue time instead of us standing up and lecturing. So that's why we're going to continue seeing. <coughs> but I, I don't know how you wanted it. There was one hand up. Yeah. Yeah. No, two. I was find really it roll that way? Yeah. Okay, no, my back here first. I Sorry. Just, I just want to follow up on your comments, Bill, about the study in the, the, I don't know if it's the DNR, who it is, it's doing, this is the paper the other day about the, the, the water pollution of the nitrates in southern Minnesota. Yes. And the, the figures that I saw, if I remember them right, is that there's like 800 tons per acre of fertilizer that's put on that land. No. Um, average of a lot. Typical rate on corn is. I uh, even got my calculator because I said this is. <laughs> maybe it was a typo good. in the article, but Any, anywhere from maybe yeah. 80 pounds to 150 pounds. It depends a lot on um, whether it's following a legume crop. You know, soybeans or alfalfa contributes a uh, uh, certain amount of. Yeah, and so you also get into those, those yeah. differences. No. Thank you. Yeah. So just uh, yeah, the size of that 800 sounds big, and the tons sounds. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Sounds like the state total or something. Yeah. yeah, I was intrigued by your question to us, actually, since this is more of a discussion. Sure. When you were talking about the interest in risk management, and you asked, well, how much um, should consumers pay for the risk in farming? And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's a good question. And then I thought back to, well, majority of our farms are the big industrial farms, but we've seen a lot of growth in the last 20 years in the smaller farms, especially in the organic farms, with the increase in organic products that people are buying. And I immediately thought, well, you know, there's sort of an answer. We've got two farming systems, the big ones, the big farms, and the small ones. And there actually is a model on how much risk a consumer wants to pay for farming when you think about CSAs, the Community Sponsored Agriculture, because a person pays a share up front, up front. Mm -hmm. and, and it, 
And here's where I think it's interesting because the um, the small farmer, the small organic farmer, is diversified in the way they farm, and they have many different crop, many different crops. And so, if there's a loss, they're not likely to have a total loss. And so that works on a small scale. I and I don't see how that would ever work on a big scale. But I guess the question is, how much growth are we going to be seeing in um, Minnesota? Do you think with the small with the, the smaller, the medium-sized organic farms, or, or nationally, since actually we're talking about um, federal, legal women voters, federal ag policy, because if, if we're dealing with a model at a small level that works, well, maybe we're, we're going to be seeing that happen more and more throughout the country with um, the interest in the local food movement of buying and eating local food and covering the risk for it. I don't see the CSA model going very far as a percent. And they've often talked to, always in many years have talked about the growth in organic food being 20% per year. But the, uh, the amount of organic food is here and the amount of food eaten is up here. It's still a, it's a big percent gain and a small percent of the total food production. Uh, the CSA, the organic, the local foods, that's all in it's in such a different set of products in the CSA. The large farms and the you know, large industrial, there's subject label terms in that too. So, uh, but you know, the uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, meat production, eggs, that's all so different than the vegetables over here. There's some fruit, but you know, you go out to California, there's very large uh, fruit and nut orchards there, but there's still that set of small orchards. So how fast will it grow? I I don't know, but you know your thought about sharing risk with CSA is uh, one I had not thought of before. But I'm not sure how we can translate, extrapolate that to uh, all the corn and soybeans because. You know, even if you're in the middle of uh, St. Paul or Minneapolis, uh, it's easy, easier. But how to get connected to a CSA, community-supported ag? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 How many of you belong to CSAs now? Uh, or even just urban farming, your own backyard. Yeah. It's interesting that I was looking at an article today from, uh, I don't remember where it's from, I did a lot of looking at articles, but we spend about eight times more money to support from the federal perspective what they call commodity crops, which are the corn, soybeans, cotton, rice, and wheat, than we do on fruits, vegetables, and nuts, which I find to be a staggering amount in that, that something like... Is it even that small? Uh, this is a fairly recent article, yeah. Uh, that something like 80 to 85 percent of the money that the federal government pays for crop insurance and subsidies goes to the 10 percent of farmers who have these big commercial farms, which to me is a real out of balance way to spend taxpayer money. Yeah, you're not and the only one. Good. <laughs> I would like to think that our committee is taking is, is addressing that uh, the conference conference committee, but in is, is there anything that's, that's in the wind that's bringing that more into balance that, no? It's, uh, it's always a, I have to let Bill talk, it's always a problem of uh, the money as the votes. Uh, and especially behind the scenes, uh, talk and discussions uh, on the conference bills, the, uh, the title in the farm bill that for, uh, horticulture and specialty crops and vegetables, uh, that that finally became part of the farm bill last time around, in no way. In a more major way, some of the research was in there, little bits became its own title. So it hasn't been around, even that much hasn't been around that long. But are they addressing that 
eight percent. I don't think so. Uh, crop insurance. Way out of balance. There's some talk uh, on the com commodity side. They're saying, "Wow, we're we're finally shutting down. Uh, millionaires can't get their payments." To make, right. If your yeah. adjusted gross income is more than seven hundred fifty thousand, yeah. you won't get one anymore. But that's a step. <coughs> It's still a large operation. I know farms that make uh, investment decisions and buy new machinery to have the write off so they can keep their income down below 750 so they aren't shut out. But that's not true on the crop insurance side. There is no limit on that side. So, in terms of, uh, you know, it's still targeted mostly to the commodity, six or seven or eight. And the House bill cuts out livestock insurance right now. That, that was hard fought to get in, and now they're talking about taking it back out. Can I ask a macro question? Um, you referenced the um, Minnesota farms, of the 80,000 farms in Minnesota, 20%, oh, excuse me, 20,000 20, are the round numbers are the commercial size. Now, commercial size, explain that briefly for me so I can go on to ask the rest of my questions. Uh, aside from the vegetables and the smaller farms, is it 100,000 in sales, 250,000 in sales? Uh, it's kind of a distinction. Can that farm in itself? Produce a family living in it. If you're smaller than that, you need income from somewhere else. And it's, you know, 70%, 80% of the revenue always seems to always go towards expenses. So if your sales are uh, 100,000, that means you only have 20 or 30,000 again in round numbers. So you have to be up around. 250 or 3 to get a lot of people would say is a nice living level. So, so that's kind of where the line is. <coughs> so something that is more industrial sized is the minority of the number of farms in Minnesota. Very much. Okay. And then... So all, all the 20,000 as well as the 80,000. Right. Yeah. And then when it comes to the economic, anything that has a major impact on the economy, sort of the Cargill size, whatever, whatever, is what we are doing promoting a trade, economic, commercial value at the higher end, and is that the right bang for the buck versus uh, the medium to smaller sized farms that are more likely to be at the whim of um, Adverse economic uh, weather, um, you know, vicissitudes, and being too, they they have so much invested in capital. Uh, I mean, you get where I'm going with this. Is the, is is there a commensurate level of where we are putting our uh, bang for our buck, or are we? Throwing too much money in the run. How are we lined up? I think, it, at least from my perspective, it's it's a little hard to sort out. I, obviously, farms are getting bigger at a rapid rate. And it's been going on for a long time. It's hard to sort out how much of that is because of policies, how much is because of technology and other things. I think it, it, it seems like consensus I've heard over the years is that uh, actually price stabilization policies have helped uh, the growth of specialized livestock operations, specialized crop operations. When I grew up, we had 
of profits in livestock. You know, you lose on if prices are low, you, you gain on the livestock side. If prices are high, you gain on the crop side. So to stabilize prices, then you have very large livestock operations that buy their grain instead of growing it, and, and that's uh, more uh, feasible. Uh, so that that's been been said. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of technological reasons why they're growing too. So. Yeah, a couple of comments in my a question back here that hasn't got answered or asked yet. Um, you know, what, what is the reason for the policy? It's the goal of the policy. Uh, they always talk about a, a, a safe and stable and cheap food supply. They don't say that the, the farm policy is to keep the small people as farmers. That's, that's kind of a somewhat touted sometimes, but it's always a safe, stable, and cheap food is the ultimate goal. And how do you attain that? Many times that is just helping the, the more efficient farmers become larger. Uh, is that, and that still doesn't say that's right. Uh, there's an argument going on now at the, the, the world level. Is it always just economic growth as a measure of uh, success and well-being, um, success and uh, goodness, or is it we need to talk about other indices of uh, well-being, and that gets at a, a bit to the question. Is it always just economic side, or is there a well-being as in health and all those other things that are going on? Uh, but it, it seems like the policy always drives toward the cheapness of a good food supply, and that always seems to end up helping the larger operation you know, they produce more. So there's a question that has to be asked. She's raised her hand several times. Um, I just wondered uh, what the philosophy is here in Minnesota with what's going on with the butterfly population and the herbicides, and um, are we really looking at at that? It's like the canary in the, the cave, if you will. Mm -hmm. And where are we going with that? Um, go ahead. <laughs> As I understand it, uh, that butterfly study, the early butterfly study was uh, flawed in a couple of ways in the way they're looking at it, that it's not the canary. You know, there's still a concern, uh, there's, you know, coming in and out, but apparently that's, I mean, it's not the, uh, it's not Monsanto is saying this either, it's some other scientists. So the, the way they looked at it, the way they did it, uh, there was a problem there, but it's not the problem. We shouldn't worry too much about that being seen. Are they the same one saying there's no global warming? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But I, I follow the, yeah. the, the honeybee issue a lot more yeah, than right. the butterfly right. right. issue. Yeah, yeah the, I'm sorry, the butterfly and the honeybee. Right. Yeah. 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 I really don't know the answer on that either. But it certainly is a concern. And are they, what is, is anything being done here? Or, in reference, say, to the honeybee situation, or you know, what is the current thing? I know we have the, uh, an expert at the University of Minnesota, uh, Mars. 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 Uh, who is uh, working on that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mars. Mars. I don't think they know for sure what the cause is, so they don't <coughs> quite know, you know what, what direction to go. Yeah, Marlo Spivak. Yeah. Yeah, I think they have an idea, but they don't. They, they've got some possible causes yeah. for it, um, and they're they're not. You know, they still haven't been going to this exactly. It could it could be um, just the pathology. It could be um, the fact that hives have been shipped from one place in the country to the other. But that's been going on for forty years, and so they don't really know that that that's a reason for it. And then also the pesticides, and there's you know a whole cocktail of pesticides right, that that are being being mm -hmm. used. But um, Australia doesn't have the problem that that we have. They're not losing their honeybees, so they're actually shipping their um, their honeybees over to the United States. But they also have, I think, um, some very strict controls as far as importing anything too. I mean they look at their ships and they look at their their uh, crops that are uh, being imported to make sure that there isn't something that is, is going to cause a problem. Um, 
I think we're kind of leading into um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is, you know, I started taking a look at the sustainable agriculture, and I'm kind of overwhelmed with what the definition is. We're kind of skirting the issue. We're talking about pesticides, we're talking about the butterflies and the bumblebees. So, so what, what's the definition, and what are the economic incentives, if any, that are in place or that we need? So first, what is it? Because the definition is enormous, I think. Yeah. It depends on who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's economics, it's uh, the environment, uh, you know, it's all of it's long term. The community, uh, yeah. social. But then there's arguments about how to measure each of those, too. Do so, we have any measurements now? <laughs> there isn't, a, as far as I know, there's no consistent rule about how to measure it. So, so we want it, we think it's a good thing, but we don't know how to measure it. <coughs> yeah, if we, if we find it, we'll like it, we know what it is. Identify <laughs> <laughs> what it is. And you're right, yeah. it's huge, it can like social, environmental, yeah. it's all can, of this. And you're talking about a lot of the farm surviving, is that food safe, yeah. and what's happening environmentally. We can measure a lot of things, but what is the, what is the set? Right. That brings, me my, that brings me to my question. No, I was just curious about if you've been following what um, has been going on in Argentina. With uh, I read an article in the New York Times, it was probably like a month ago, and my memory is really not serving me very well, but um, there's tons of chemicals dumped into these crops. I think it was their soybeans. Tons of chemicals and um, pesticides, and I know there's a law in place there that it's like a thousand feet from residential areas or something, and the government's just kind of turning a blind blind eye to it, and you know it's getting in water. And lately, the you know rates for cancer have skyrocketed. Kids are being born with deformities. And I was just wondering if there was like any update or if you knew of anything. And I love Argentinian wine, so I yeah. yeah. So I was wondering if you know like the wine is safe to drink and safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that was just something no, I sorry. wish I had brought the article, but uh, this doesn't have speakers. Yeah. She says it's awesome. It, it seems like, I mean, you referenced the fact that uh, the largest source of pollution in the Mississippi River now is agricultural. It's not the point uh, sources anymore. And, um, and yet there is a lot of technology out there that would, would help to address that. And, and we, we don't seem to require that in any fashion. We don't hold the, the farmers accountable for the source of the pollution. I mean, when cities were polluting the waters with their uh, sanitary sewer system, well, basically they were told she fixed it. You know, you're accountable for that. And 3M gets uh, chemicals in the wells and put there, and uh, all of a sudden they spend tens of millions of dollars to fix it. I mean, why don't we hold uh, farmers accountable in that same yeah. fashion? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, uh, and uh, <coughs> I, don't, I, I know that uh, certainly. Uh, Weather variability uh, is, is a big issue in agriculture, more so than in manufacturing situation. Just how to dictate what they do every day of the year when the wet year this year and next year is dry, that sort of thing. So I, I think it's going to be difficult to craft some regulations and requirements that, that deal with all those management issues. But I think that's going to be the thing in the next couple of years is, is figuring out, I guess, from an economist standpoint, our, our standard. Uh, answer to uh, have reduce uh, consumption of something like fertilizer is to raise the price, you know, tax it, uh, and uh, make it more expensive. People will use less of it. But that's not a very politically feasible thing to do, probably. Uh, so you could put uh, you know, limits on the, uh, the uh, rate per acre that they can put on. So you can go out there and watch the farmer when they turn that nut on the uh, the fertilizer spreader to adjust the rate, you know, how you can enforce uh, that, or you somehow just uh, limit production and then let farmers bid for a limited supplies. Just how would you uh, regulate it? It's going to be the issue. It's going to be the huge issue. It's also a global marketer uh, as well. I mean, so, no matter what we do here, I mean, Obviously, in Argentina, <laughs> they have different different rules for how they uh, compete, which affects the price they can choose as well, I suspect, from an economic perspective. I read about India and China, too, they subsidize very low price, and so 
farmers uh, herds put huge amounts on, much more than than they do here, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a worldwide problem. The other, uh, I've been working on, on phosphorus, but another thing that I've been hearing about a little bit recently is uh, phosphorus, and I'm saying that from a water quality standpoint, phosphorus and nitrogen are both huge issues. And I've worked with the livestock industry and their excess over application manure and excess buildup of phosphorus around the facilities is, uh, is a big issue. But there's also uh, a concern that phosphorus minerals for fertilizer uh, mining is a mining mineral that uh, is exhaustible and at some point we may run out of sources of, of phosphorus for or fertilizer. It, it, it's been, I just heard talk about that last week or a webinar on it, and that it's, there, it sounds like there's there are more reserves of phosphorus than there is oil and gas, but, but not a lot more. And over the course of the next couple hundred years, we, we may run out of phosphorus fertilizer. I'm saying back in the 1800s, people scavenged for bones to make phosphorus fertilizer out of because it was not available anywhere else. And more immediate concern right now is that the biggest source of phosphorus fertilizer is Morocco and Western Sahara, in Western Sahara. And it's not politically the most stable part of the world. And so things can happen there. So that's another perspective on, on phosphorus that you don't really hear about a lot. Uh, could you speak to the conservation incentive for farmers? It used to be a big issue, and now it's kind of not quite so important. I didn't have to get that back to you. In the Farm Bill? Uh, it's in the Senate version. The cross compliance that they have to meet the conservation mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. uh, the House uh, doesn't have that, especially in the crop insurance side. And the crop insurance is becoming bigger than the commodity <coughs> programs in many ways. The House doesn't have that requirement, but the Senate does include it that you, you have to uh, comply with all the environmental conservation regulations, and if you don't, you don't get a payment. But, you know, how effective and how good that is. But the rules and the ideas are there, uh, so we'll see what happens in the conference bill or not. What's the yeah. objection to it in the House site? Over regulation. Mm -hmm. Back to that one, one person's regulation, so it's that, great, and the other person sees it as over. The 10% that gets 84% of the dollars has the biggest voice. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah. How can we uh, yeah. stop and get around that? Um, I've also heard you know, that uh, proposed by those closer to the discussions than I that there's three ideas on what might happen with the Farm Bill. One, the conference committee does indeed figure out how to pass a new version of it with all these rules and we'll see what that might be look like. The second one was they can't figure out what to do with it, so they extend the old bill for a couple more years to get past the election so I'm not have to do it again next year. And the third one is that uh, they don't get any of those done. And it just falls apart. And it goes back to the 49 laws. Uh, but part of that, if they don't get anything done, there might be a rider somewhere that says they take away that 1949 rules which is what you hear about, where milk prices go to 12 bucks a gallon, and food would go this, and all those other programs that are now there, like conservation, would disappear, because they're not in that 49 legislation. I understand that a number of years ago, Australia, I mentioned Australia again, um, looked at how to support conservation, and some of the um, issues that um, are included by sustainability. Sustainability, as you mentioned, do we just want cheap food, or do we want to have a a, um, a farm that supports its community and addresses the the community needs as well as the environmental needs? Mm -hmm. And the, Australia developed um, a national system for paying farmers, not just for conservation land, but for having a sustainable farm, which um, supported community needs and values as well as environmental issues. Do you know if that type of 
um, approach has been discussed at all in the United States? Seriously, at a high level, probably not. Um, but I don't. I'm not familiar with that Australian law. I know we talk about equal system services sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I've never heard that as a serious addition to the farm bill. I think they were talking. Yeah, they talked yeah. about ecosystem services, which is the way of capturing all these other externalities. Yeah. It's probably not going to happen in this uh, climate, but I guess it's something that could be considered for the future. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, talk some about GMO um, seed or hybrid? That was also mentioned. What is the difference between uh, GMO seed and hybrid seed? And then also, uh, I understand from what I read that um, like a herbicide, if, if it's GMO seeds, it needs less, um, maybe less uh, Fertilizer. No. I mean, there's, there's kind of a relationship there, and I'm, could you talk about that too? I guess uh, it's probably neither one of us are the best people to talk about the details. I mean, but from what you hear, um, one one example that I've heard about is uh, corn that's more drought resistant. But the, the more recent varieties are are more drought resistant than the older ones were and that um, advanced breeding techniques were involved in, in breeding those those newer varieties and just how much of that is molecular manipulation that, that it's fits into the GMO definition, how much is other kind of breeding, so, I'm not quite sure of it. So in other words, if the corn needs less moisture to grow. Right, right, right. It's, Yields are hurt less in a drought like we had last year uh -huh. than they might have been. Those, are just, those aren't widely available right now. They're yeah. just starting to come out. But some of your questions, the, the hybrid is purely a seed from traditional breeding techniques to plant breeders. If you watch uh, Norman Orlog and notice where they're out there and doing the little things, that's all traditional plant breeding, nothing of the genetic engineering. Okay, uh, so and that, the hybrids are. You know, some people like them, some, but most people say that's okay. They're not as worried about those. The GMOs are more specifically genetic engineering, where they're in there actually manipulating DNA. Uh, that's the controversy. Uh, and that's where the... Uh, do they take DNA from some other plant and put it into another um, plant? In some cases. In some cases. Um, but a lot of it's just within the the plant itself, they figure out how to, this is where I don't know, how to turn on and off different sequences within that plant. And I think that's where some of the droughts coming from. You know, if, if you look at a field of uh, corn in Minnesota uh, through hybrids, uh, the original plant, maize, was one that kind of just grew along the, the ground. And now it's you know, standing straight up. And that was all traditional plant breeding and hybrids. Um, it, it's kind of too bad that uh, what came out first in GMOs and genetic engineering is the, uh, the weed resistance and all the things that farmers like uh, and that Monsanto and others can uh, capture and get money for. It, it hasn't been uh, the benefits of the consumer and the food quality. And those that come along, we might have a very different picture come along first. We might have a very different thought about those. Um, but it's really the, the change in herbicides is that the Monsanto, the Roundup Ready, mm -hmm. um, Roundup Ready is considered a lot less toxic to the environment and to uh, humans than, than what it replaces. And the advantage to farmers is that it's much easier to manage and control and decide what to put on. So that's why it took off so fast. It seems, I guess, my, my perspective is that, that there's so many different types of GMO uh, products out there that you, you need to look at on a case-by-case -case 
basis. I'm, I'm not personally concerned about eating some GMO product, but my, my wife is a little more concerned about that than I am. But, but then there's also issues about spreading pollen from a GMO variety to a non-GMO and causing problems and that, that sort of There's a lot of different potential problems out there uh, that, that I can think of. Uh, uh, there's a question in the back. Yeah, in I, I, was, I was just going to say that uh, plant geneticists have been working very hard on making better plants. For instance, there's a variety of rice that uh, is yellow because it uh, produces more uh, vitamin A, which is a vitamin that's missing in, in rice. And there would be a huge benefit in some parts of the world where people don't have enough, get enough vitamin A if they could grow this rice, where, which people accept and would eat. Uh, and, but it has vitamin A. Well, but the gene for the vi producing the vitamin A in the rice comes from some other organism that the plant geneticist has added. And so people are upset because this is an artificial, uh, you know, terrible thing that's going to. But but all the traditional plant um, experiments are uh, traditional breeding is just doing the same thing over a very much longer period of time because what plant people have been doing is picking out, you know, an example of something that they want to uh, propagate and breeding it with, you know, something else and, and get uh, a better hybrid. Well, there, there is a, there are some differences that they can go in and tweak those DNAs and sequences and make some differences that isn't quite a traditional fast traditional. Uh, and the vitamin A, uh, the golden rice, the beta carotene, uh, there's a lot of concern that people will not like yellow rice. They just won't eat it because it doesn't look like what they're used to. Uh, and there's also the debate about, well, why don't we just teach them how to grow carrots? <laughs> yeah, they get it quicker and easier that way. And, and I don't know why no, that doesn't happen. You know, that there are other plants that you get that vitamin A from. But I've, I've asked and never gotten a good answer. Uh, on, uh, Starlink corn, remember, it was about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a problem with uh, tacos, uh, Taco John's or Taco Bell's. People all, all of a sudden, allergies grew up. It was a corn, genetically engineered corn, that was supposed to just go to feed. And somehow got into the human food, it got into tortillas uh, that caused allergy outbreaks among sensitive people. So there, there is a, a real <coughs> concern out there. And another concern is that it, that means that all these companies can put copyrights on the life materials. So there's a, a real concern from that view of control and uh, come back to finances. So to continue on with that, that just seems like a no-brainer then. Why don't we have like GMO labeling on food? I mean, is it, that just, I don't know. They don't, they don't want to say how far it is. Right. You know, with 96, 97, 98% of the soybeans ground up ready, then modify, look at any label you buy and you'll find uh, soybean oil. I, I, would, I wouldn't have any problem with, with doing that. I think the, the industry argument against that is that it makes it look like the, the, a the GMO, there's something wrong with the GMO. Yeah. Right? And then the GMO is a bad name. Okay, well, put it there. Like, <coughs> and that would be everything. Yeah. yeah, I know that was a hot issue, like at the state like, this year. I think it'll come back this next session, but I'm just curious about that. I just wanted to follow up, uh, go back to the, uh, to the farm size issue that we talked about a while back, and that's just to, to remember that there are a lot of part-time farms out there, in fact, the whole taxonomy of farms, retirements, and that sort of thing, that, that uh, so that a lot of small farms are are surviving there because there's an off-farm job or something that's supporting, not that that's good or bad or anything like that, but that, uh, that is a, an important part of the issue. Farms are not all the same, and uh, farm income is really important in some cases, and not in other cases. So, uh, and actually, 
PRPA has a whole taxonomy of about eight or ten different types of farms, value and home, and assets, and other things that are kind of interesting. But if you look at the number of farms, it's the uh, small farms are high and the big ones, and it's just this U shape. And if you look at production, the percent of production goes up to the larger farms, the percent of acres kind of goes along. The government payments for this production. There was a question here that we skipped over. Here. Oh, Thank it was you. just a, a couple of years ago. I remember a uh, program, probably on PBS. Um, they were talking about farmers who wanted to save the seed, you know, from their corn, and that they were harassed by the company. Monsanto. Okay, whoever it was that uh, said they said it was patented and they could not use that corn. Yeah, it's um, in. Yeah, it's in the uh, when the farmer buys it, Monsanto and then the other company, they they have to assign sign a contract that says they will not keep that seed because it is patented and that's one of the arguments besides the you know the food safety issue and it, you know in legal terms they are they can't save it you know if it had their own the old uh, open pollinated before hybrid open pollinated you could keep that soybeans were very big on that uh, but some of the argument, um, I think it's out of Canada, that this non, well, maybe he had some, but he claimed that he found this soybean seed growing on the side of the road or in his field from a neighbor's and was spraying it and it was, wasn't dying, spraying it with Roundup and started collecting it, growing it himself. His argument was, well, it came in, so it must be mine because it was on my field. And Monsanto was saying, that, no, our, that's our DNA. And the court upheld Monsanto. But that, that law of um, allowing patents of biological organs like that is sort of something that could be changed if, if there was a level to change it. To, Point will be changed? No, I don't. But you don't it's something you could work on. I guess if you okay. felt it was important. Uh, we can't trust anything that has to do with chemicals, whether it's farming or the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. There's a lot of money. You know, I, I kind of, I kind of feel a lot of our discussion that we're talking about is we're we're tweaking a system that has grown and has changed. And I'm getting back to what you said about well, uh, Australia has this model that they're doing is how do we get beyond the tweaking and you know we talked about the system, you pull on one part and it pushes, creates an effect on the other. How do we deal with the total system as opposed to how much crop insurance, how much subsidy, the little issues, how do we get above that? <laughs> In the list of resources, there are some interesting videos okay. to watch. Uh -huh. uh, but my concern there is that you know those are the good managers that put it together in their situation. Okay. Can that be transported to others? Uh, and I think it's also in one of the pieces I read. Uh, the uh, you know why why is it why do we have a system we have now? Because all these uh, these inputs these special things people could either through hybrids, and you have to keep buying hybrids too, because usually the, the next generation doesn't work as well. But that's not genetic engineering or license it's biology. Um, so they have to be crossed the one way to the other. But all of that's purchased. Uh, the fertilizer, uh, the chemicals are all purchased, and that gives those companies money to do research to keep pushing, going down that road. And the organic, uh, the lower sustainable, Where's the uh, companies that have things to sell there for the money? So who's investing in push the production there? Interesting. Uh, and let me follow up on that just a little. Are we are we getting too much into kind of a monoculture if of everything so that when we have in the logging industry, we 
you know, cut down the whole nine yards and then only plant these kinds of, but so there, there, yeah, so that there isn't the richness of uh, variety and uh, individual DNA stuff so that some may suffer in this circumstance, but others will survive, and, and so that you get that ability overall to be able to have some survivability uh, under lots of varying circumstance. I mean, are we at risk at all of getting too monoculture? Should we change our diet? We certainly are away from wheat and corn and meat. Can we switch to vegetables and fruits? Uh, if, we, if we ain't gonna do that, we might see a huge change in that. Doesn't that take us back to your question about there's, there's models out there to look at yeah. for influencing and your question about CSA, where the CSA has a workable model that is basically around fruits and vegetables. I mean, you can get meat from CSA, but that's not the main emphasis of it. And if that's a model that works on a small scale, can it be something we look at for a bigger scale to look at the whole farm bill and the whole uh, agriculture? Thing if we look at, yeah, the, yeah, the whole food policy, what? What do the, uh, the doctors and medical people say we should eat more of and less of? What is the farm bill support? Your early comments were about how organic would be, maybe we'd be moving towards a more hybrid system where we would be saying in different parts of the country on a case-by-case -case basis, where does it make more sense to have more organic type sustainable farms versus what's traditional? So maybe what we're trying to wrestle with here with um, our 1988 policy, our policy says that we want to deal with sustainability, but what we're trying to do is figure out how to help move our existing system and our existing policies from, from something that when this was written was more theoretical, and now we have a couple of um, models. They may be small models, and they may be in other countries, but I guess what the league is, might want to do is look at how we can move towards uh, more hybrid systems, more less dependence on just the monocultures for corn. And, and well, corn, a lot of that is, isn't even human food. That's that's fuel and that's sugar. So and that's, you can't even eat raw and, soybeans. And, yeah, we don't do that much with soybeans. We have to process them a lot. Um, and we have enough food being pro uh, produced to feed people around the world many, many times, but the issue is the distribution of that food. And so if we ate less meat, there'd be more ground to right. produce food. Right. And and I, I'm involved in several projects looking at the economics of, of for biomass crops like switchgrass or hybrid poplar or something like that for energy production. And one of the, the rationales for doing that is it would be a third crop for southern Minnesota to, to mix in with the corn and, and soybeans and mix in with the the drop in natural gas prices that really makes it difficult for uh, a uh, bioenergy pro mm -hmm. processing plant to be uh, feasible and feasible to grow those crops. And it's really uh, tough sledding to actually make that go. But uh, that's one thing we've tried to do to try to lend a little bit of diversity to the, to the, uh, the landscape. And maybe it's even moving, uh, updated by saying it shouldn't just be ag policy, it should be food policy. Yeah. Yes. And if we said we want to get good food, by that right. and we started with a blank sheet of paper on policy, it would look very different. Yeah. Yes. It is interesting looking at our diet, my, my wife's got me, the historical foods, and uh, our, our parents uh, uh, made it and uh, used it. Quince jelly and elderberry pie, and a lot of things like that that just they're not in the stores anymore. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, is, is food uh, kind of artificially cheap in this country compared to other countries in the world as a percentage of our you know, income or something else? It's definitely cheap, but it's artificially cheap or not. I don't know how you define artificial. Yeah. But it's I have the same cheap. response. It is a less percent. Maybe how to describe artificial? You know, I was in uh, Kowalski's the other day, and they had avocados, and they had 
the organic one right next to the other one. And, yeah. and the organic one was like two for four dollars, and the other one was four for five dollars. <laughs> you know, thinking I was coming here and having watched the video on organic, and, oh, this is going to be a problem. Because <laughs> 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 you know, both, both say that is that price difference due to cost of production, or is it due to markets? Yeah. Yeah. The consumer yeah. being willing yeah. to pay yeah. more for this one sold. Mm -hmm. I got a whole charge more. It doesn't have anything to do with cost. So there's that side. Too. Wrap up question. Sure. Yes. Um, Rebecca has said she'd like to do the wrap up question. I want, by the way, I do want to thank you both for being so generous with your time, your experience, and your knowledge. Thank you, thank you. And, and before the wrap up, uh, Bill and I both said we'd be willing to respond to look for other information. Oh. You're not a 24-hour a day job. <laughs> we won't walk away and never talk to you again. Okay, you wonderful. Know. Yes, I do. Which takes right into my wrap-up question. This study update that we're working on has two parts. One is the technology issues, GMOs, herbicides, water pollution, aquifer depletion, etc. The other is the finance issues that we've talked about tonight. And as we talk about those, and I did some thinking, those fight each other, don't they? Is that they, they, they seem to be counterproductive, is that if you do one, it takes away from the other and vice versa. Not always in a bad way, but, but they, don't, they don't seem to be mutually supportive. <laughs> Would you agree with that? And then what can we do as a league to influence local, <laughs> state, federal, thinking on the farm bill and all these food issues, better, better food policy issues. You know, I hadn't thought of them as being diametrically opposed to the they technology are sort versus of, finance. They are sort of. The free it's market right. doesn't consider the externalities. Yeah. I mean, the first right. part, we're talking about um, externalities, and then we're talking about the free market to determine prices, which we have supported, so I would agree that it, it yeah. does. It, we're, we don't. Right. We're not talking about sustainability in an economical market. way. Yeah, to me, that technological <laughs> technological improvements yeah. aren't necessarily uh, <coughs> counter to the financial, but but the externality issue certainly is important and needs to be needs to be considered. You know the. You know, part of what, maybe what you're talking about is that these two different paths, this path we're going down with high technology, high inputs, uh, does create an ag finance problem mm -hmm. in terms of the costs. Um, which favors the 10% the who are the commercial farmers, which defavors the people who are, uh, defavors, is that a word? <laughs> it is tonight. <laughs> the people who are in need of uh, food support, the SNAP program, so that they they keep tugging and pulling, and that's where the conference committee gets all hung up, is because yeah. one side favors kind of one aspect, and the other favors the other. I can put that off on the third yeah. point versus the two you have. Yeah. Probably a lot of things we haven't touched on tonight, but one one thing that comes to mind or is on my mind is that uh, they go out to the rural Minnesota and South, did a meeting at Slayton uh, last week. And you got uh, rural Minnesota already anywhere in rural area in the whole country, the whole world really, and you see a lot of gray hair. <laughs> and uh, one one son lives downtown Chicago, and a couple other kids live in, in Washington D.C. area. And you go there, and everybody you see is like 30 years old, and it seems like we got a real, some real generational issues about the future of agriculture that. We yeah, have touched on tonight, but I think it is an issue. Is, is what's I think your program just in the last week or two, uh, probably again on NPR or, or PBS, where there is a a small start, but it's a movement of people who left their family farm who were starting to go back to them. Yeah. yeah. But that, you know, a little bit of that's always happened. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it was the purpose of the program. So it's fine. <coughs> yeah. I don't know how many of you are fans of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but when I was trying to decide what we should call the program this evening, 
I thought, oh my gosh, this is like life, the universe, and everything. And it turns out, of course, the answer is not 42. So. Well, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> <laughs> that was page three. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming, and I think they deserve a big round of applause.